This is the eLearn Podcast. If you're passionate about the future of learning, you're in the right place. The expert guests on this show provide insights into the latest strategies, practices, and technologies for creating killer online learning outcomes. My name's Laddick, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. The eLearn Podcast is sponsored by eLearn Magazine, your go-to resource for all things online learning. Click-by-click how-to articles, the latest in edtech, spotlight on successful outcomes and trends in the marketplace. Subscribe today and never miss a post at elearnmagazine.com. And OpenLMS, a company leveraging open source software to deliver effective, customized, and engaging learning experiences for schools, universities, companies, and governments around the world since 2005. Learn more at openlms.net. Hello there, my name's Ladik, and my guest for this episode is Pablo Ferreiro, who joins me in his role as head of B2B sales for the Americas for the company Elsa. Pablo is also a co-founder of Coder House, which is backed by Y Combinator, and the founder and CEO of Nordler. Oh, and in his spare time, he's also run across the Andes Mountains. In this cage match-like conversation, Pablo and I talk about the surprisingly lengthy history of Elsa Speaks, and I mean that in the best way, and what their focus is today and how they serve their customers. We also talk about how AI is changing the space of education and learning, and Pablo offers his opinion about which tasks AI can handle better than humans. Pablo then discusses the potential issues of AI talking with AI with the advent of publicly available generative AI products. And then we move into the topic of ethics and Pablo's views on the importance of this with something like more than 53 million users a day on the Elsa platform. Pablo then offers the challenges he receives in an enterprise sales process about using AI in recruiting and upskilling and what can be done about those challenges. And then we tie our conversation in a bow at the end, as we usually do, where Asking Pablo about, you know, where does he see things going over the next few years in the interface between the L&D department and the HR department using a tool like Elsa? And how much is that line blurring between working with humans and working with AI? And remember, we record this podcast live so that we can interact with you, our listeners, in real time. So if you'd like to join the fun every week on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on YouTube, just come over to elearnmagazine.com and hit subscribe. Now, I give you Pablo Ferreiro. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the eLearn Podcast. My name is Ladik, as you just heard, and I'm here with Pablo, whose last name, whose last name, I'm just going to just destroy it, Ferreiro? The close uh, Ferreiro. But Ferreiro. It's a, it's a, it's a hard one. I'll as admit. a good host, I should have known that. I should have known that, Ferreiro. And then I just realized right before we started, I'm like, I've never asked you how you pronounce your family name. Anyway, so Pablo Ferreiro, Ferreiro um, you are with Elsa, or you know, as, as some people find it's elsaspeaks.io, or you know, there's a couple of different ways it, it pops up on the interwebs. Um, as we always do here, I'm, I'm really interested because I've, I've, I have couched this conversation. I have defined this conversation as a cage match between AI and human tasks and, you know, what, which ones can, can, you know, what, what can AI do better? What can humans still do better? But before we get into that, um, tell us about who you are. Give us the 30, 60 seconds on who you are and, and the, the company that you represent. Sure. Well, thanks so much for, uh, you know, giving me the, the space. Super excited to be here with you to chat, uh, even though it's a, it's a one-on-one, but, uh, you know, there's people out there listening in. So super excited to be here. Um, yes, yeah, I'm Paolo. Uh, right now, I'm leading Elsa for uh, what we call the Americas region. So anything from you know the U.S. to Brazil, that's me. I help uh, both organizations in the corporate world, but also in the education sector, bring our technology, our products to help their workers or their learners improve their communication skills. Um, and so that's really what I do every day. Um, and so, yeah, super happy to, to be here. Super cool. And, you know, just so people understand your expertise and kind of where you come from, give us a background on Elsa. Like how I know that I know the story, but I'd love to hear it from your words about, you know, who started it, how it began and then kind of what, you know, if I show up at ElsaSpeaks.io, what am I going to experience? 
Sure, I think the the the, the story is uh, Vu, the, the the founder. You know, she uh, originally from Vietnam. She went to school uh, and uh, at, at Stanford, obviously a great school. Uh, but she realized, you know, right after she graduated and started working at a you know large large company, that she was sort of missing out on certain opportunities due to her uh, her accent, due to her uh, perhaps inability to communicate as fluently as maybe someone who's, you know, uh, from, you know, uh, speaks English uh, natively. Mm -hmm. So out of that pain, out of that frustration, she thought, okay, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do something about this. And so she went around the world to find a, an AI expert. Uh, and she, uh, she found him uh, in Portugal of all places. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, found the right expert, uh, and Xavier, uh, it's his name. And, uh, you know, he's got a hundred peer review papers on, on AI linguistics. And so together they, they built Elsa. It really first started as a, a B2C, right? A play. So just for consumers. Uh, mm -hmm. so if you go to, you know, to our app, uh, you can download it in any app store or, or, or play or, you know, Google play. Um, and, uh, yeah, download it, uh, and you know, run an assessment on your English level, and then do a couple exercises to to improve your your communication skills. So that's sort of the the the, the background story on on that. Um, uh, but yeah, here we are, nine years later. The, there's been a long journey, uh, and I'm I'm I've been just part of it uh, recently, about uh, more than a year ago. But uh, but yeah, still very very fresh. Nice. So, so yeah. And so you know, we're here to talk about. Again, that, that cage match between, you know, th there is a lot of excitement still, a lot of consternation, a lot of anxiety around, you know, how AI is changing the, the, the space of education and learning for the good, for the bad, for the ugly, for the profound. Um, so I, let's just, I, I wanted to start right off the top there. So what tasks, in your opinion, can AI handle better than humans? Like where does... And, and when we're talking about AI, we're talking about, I assume, large language models, or is there a different way that we should look at this, you know, or, or is a different definition that you're putting AI under? Sure. No, I think, I think that the definition is, is, is okay. Um, what I would say is we, you know, we are an AI, you know, company, mm -hmm. uh, but we're still learning ourselves what the best use of our own technology is, right? Where, you know, every day our product team is figuring that out, you know, what assignments uh, should a student uh, be uh, running? Uh, how can we help teachers be more efficient in the way they do lesson planning? So we, even as, as an AI company, we're still learning what AI is and can do. Um, I can I can give you maybe examples on real examples of how we found ways, uh, both in the corporate world and the education sector, uh, how AI can do a better job than human, and where the human still can do a better job than AI. So, if we look at the corporate sector or the corporate uh, world, you know we help companies run English assessments uh, okay. for candidates, right? Mm -hmm. Applying to their jobs. So we have a client that has a million candidates applying to their jobs every year. A million candidates. It's pretty, yeah, it's a big volume, right? Holy smokes. That is, I just want to like, let that simmer out Take there for it. just a second. Like, how do I, like, I'm, I'm overwhelmed when I have like six people who apply for a job, like a million candidates. Okay. Sure. It's, right. yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a little too much. And, uh, and yeah, all these candidates, um, are applying to jobs that require, you know, fluent English. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, 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 of course need to make sure they, they, they have that fluency. Um, before they started working with us, what they did was have, their recruiters uh, basically grade the English level of these uh, candidates. So you can imagine how uh, slow that process would be. Uh, Not only slow, but, but very variable, right? Like, cause you know, a human is going to have some rubric, but then, 
you know, depending upon the person and the listener and the situation, it's going to that, that, that you're going to have to get some very some considerable variability in those scores. Hi there. I'm sorry to break into the show right now, but if you're enjoying this show, if you are challenged, if you're inspired, if you're learning something, if you think that you're going to be able to get something out of this to put into your practice, do me a quick favor. Pause right now and just hit subscribe on your podcast player right now. It doesn't matter which one, just hit, hit subscribe because that way it'll make sure that you never miss an episode in the future. Thanks. Now back to the show. hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, we're, we exactly we're you know, humans are not consistent because we have different biases. Uh, mm-hmm. where, you know, uh, we have different skill sets. So, so a hundred percent, that's a fact. And, you know, the issue with that is that you might be biased towards something good or something bad. So maybe you assume that the English level is not up to par when maybe it is, and you're missing out on, on, a, an important candidate, right. Uh, or a potential, uh, employee. So. What we did is we came in and we streamlined that that process where essentially a candidate goes up to their career site, uh, completes their application, and sends a very small audio sample of, you know, why do you want to join our company in English? Mm. They respond. And then we analyze that and we're able to understand, you know, what their English level is at the pronunciation level, at the intonation level, fluency, and, and a lot of different uh, metrics. Is so, that... Is that particular for in that example, are they given a paragraph to read or is it extemporaneous? They they're basically making up their answer on the fly. They're actually making up their answer, uh, which is a good thing. You know, we want to be able to replicate uh, a normal conversation. Right? right. So if I'm a recruiter, I'm asking, hey, why do you want to join our company? And that's that's what it is. In some cases, some companies, companies just record the, the call and then give get the, the feedback from the, the candidate. Um, right after that call, so they can uh, run the the test um, live uh, in a conversation with a recruiter. So, so yeah, you, you can imagine how this can really uh, help uh, streamline a recruiting process, um, reduce costs, and 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 even recognize some talent that perhaps before wasn't recognized uh, due to some biases from from humans. Let's say. Mm-hmm. So, I think that's a pretty pretty non uh, kind of a no, no brainer example of why AI should be part of it. Now, you know, on the other hand, you know, if we look at, look at education, you know, while there are some challenges um, when it comes to, you know, having the, the teacher provide feedback in terms of communication skills, in terms of pronunciation to the students, you know, we can do a good job there, but the teacher still plays a key role for many reasons. One of them being the interpretation of the feedback. So hmm. AI, you know, uh, if you've tried ChatGPT, for example, when you ask them a question, uh, they can be uh, very, um, you know, they, they just give you a straight answer, right? But right. sometimes you need to be able to interpret interpret uh, that, that uh, information. So if our AI is telling the student that your pronunciation is 50% instead of 100%, you know, the kid might think, well, shouldn't it be 100%? Yeah, what does, know, what does that mean exactly? What does that mean exactly, right? It's like, hey, I got a, my, my schwa sound is wrong. It's like, what is schwa, schwa sound? It's, like, it's a phoneme, right? Like, who knows? I don't, you know. So the teacher needs I'm Honestly, to I don't there. even know what a schwa sound is. Perfect. I'm a native speaker. I'm like, what, when do I say schwa ever? It's, I, who knows? Exactly. It, it's, it's complicated, right? Um, even um, so, e- in this case, uh, you need the teacher to be there to help interpret that data and not frustrate the student into thinking, "Hey, maybe I should get a hundred percent." It's like, no, it's you know what, you're within your level, right? Maybe you're an intermediate English speaker. That's fine. Um, that's a one way that is super important for the teacher to be involved to help interpret the data. And then obviously to facilitate the use of the technology for the best use cases. So, um, you know, AI is not supposed to be used the whole time, right? There's right. good times to use it and there's uh, times that might not make sense to use it. So the teacher really has to become a facilitator, a technology expert, um, uh, so that it can really help the students uh, improve their communication skills. Um, and in another sense, they also need to become sort of data driven, right? They need to look at the data. They need to understand 
what um, what students are are learning, what they're having trouble with, um, and and so so I think that the role is changing a little bit. Um, I think the fundamentals are still there in terms of what the value of the teacher is, um, but I think the teacher now has more tools to be more powerful, to be more of a, a super teacher, uh, to you know, be able to understand their students better. Um, so I think that's, in my, my point of view, obviously mm. uh, very biased, but I think that's- Yeah, of course. No, uh, uh, the, um, you've just struck fear, I'm sure, into the heart of so many teachers around the world <laughs> when you're just like, wait, guess what? Now you've got to be data driven and you actually, you know, the technology and, and you know, you need to be te technically savvy and whatnot. Which, you know, quite frankly, this is one of these one of these pieces we're having to grapple with now that we're we're moving into what many people are calling the era of AI, the age of AI, right? Because because of the generative products that are now it, have been exploding onto the scene for the last year, um, I'm very interested to see how that plays out over the next ten years, right? Um, I, I think we're going to have a very different universe. Let me let me dial back to something that you. I, I, it's not a challenge, but I'm wondering if you've had this experience or any of your clients have had this experience because generative AI products are available at the retail level. They're available to every consumer and they're pretty darn powerful. Have you run up into uh, instances, let's just say in your first test with your client there does a million, you know, a million applicants there where people have shown up to the test and have either used you know an, an 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 emulator or you know used ai to basically talk to the ai right where they've come and said rather than okay clicking on their microphone they come prepped with you know that paragraph that is pretty very you know very uh, well thought out through an ai model and you know, basically you start having ai talk to ai have you started to experience that at all so in a sense maybe a candidate try, try well, you know i could go i could go or Exactly. I can go to, there's, there's plenty of services out there where I can go and I can say a paragraph and then, you know, the, the AI model will, will take my voice. And nice. then, you know, I can then just sort of, Hey, here's, here's a beautiful paragraph, you know, give me the audio for that. And then I'm going to record, you know, I'm going to play that in. I'm just wondering, the only reason I ask that is because we've seen in our lives, my life, my wife's life, whatever, uh, we've already started to see CVs, resumes becoming absolutely perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. And the answers to in typical interview questions becoming just spot on and interview processes around the world are changing, you know, as you and I are talking right now, simply because these candidates don't actually have those skills or they're not actually those people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so I don't want to say people are lying, but they're definitely able to present a much, much nicer picture. And so I'm wondering if that happens as well in this kind of testing model. That's uh, that's interesting. Um, I think from, look, I think, uh, in a sense, maybe a, a strong word would be fraud, right? Um, oh, you know, I mean, it's total cheating. It's absolutely hundred percent fraud. Like if you, if I were to roll in and have a re pre-recorded, you know, mo that's, that's complete falsehood. Let's just call yeah. it that. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, it's, it's, I've, I've, I've heard, uh, from one of our, our clients where, um, a candidate submitted a, an audio sample and uh, it turned out it was, it wasn't his voice. It was a friend of his mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. maybe had a, a better English. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we do have, uh, today, right. You know, fraud prevention and, uh, ways to sort of mitigate that, but certainly, you know, uh, that's not going to stop. Right. I mean, I think that's, it's, there's always been some sort of, uh, you know, people out there that wanting to sort of game the system, let's say, let's call it. Hundred um, percent, yeah. So, so for sure. But I, I well, think the mm -hmm, go ahead. Ahead. sorry, good. No, no, no. Go ahead. I, the only, I, I just think it's really interesting because we stumble into this moment where, at the end of the day, we've just proven the value of the human, right? In that, you know, if I I can put together any process, you know, you're going to submit a CV, you're going to submit a paper for a a test at a university. You're going to work with somebody, you know, in real day. But as soon as we put the actual humans in the moment, though, that's when, you know, that, that that's when the reality becomes apparent. And so if if you were to create that beautiful CD or you were to create that beautiful, uh, you know, submit that audio that's right. As soon as you and I start having this conversation, I'm like, oh, wait, nope, 
<laughs> that wasn't you, right? Or maybe That's I can true. ask one or two questions and I can realize, oh, you said you had that experience, but you don't really know what you're talking about, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, no, I think uh, what, what comes to mind is, you know, I use ChatGPT, you know, every day, sure. uh, you know, trying to draft an email. Um, but, you know, it, it helps me speed up my, my, my day to day. But there's always two things that I need to do to make sure it's my voice and it's the best it can be. One is my input has to be good, right? So I have to make sure that whatever I ask it to do is very clear. Mm -hmm. But also the answers are usually not perfect. Maybe they're, they sound too textbooky. Um, it sound too corporate. Mm -hmm. It's like too, you know, that's not, you know, so the, the, the tone is just, it, it seems uh, fabricated, right? Uh, so that's the kind of work that needs to happen. You need to become an editor, right? You can't just ask for the, the answer and, and, and throw that answer back to maybe your customer, right? I've seen uses of ChatGPT where, you know, I get an email and it clearly see, you know shows that, you know, they basically copy pasted the answer. And, you know, I think that's that's okay, but uh, if you do that, you lose your voice and um, you sort of become maybe commoditized, right? Mm. Um, Man, that is, I, you're I, like you're 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 speaking to my heart personally, like like you know my belief system right here, where it's just like, it, yes, efficiencies are great, but at the end of the day, where is your personal like where you know where's your personality, right? Like that's what makes. If you think of anyone famous, mm -hmm. if you think of anyone that you respect or anything like that, there is something about their personality. There's something about how they present. There's something about there's something about how they put together their combination of skills that you attach yourself to. So yeah, that, that's I think that's just such a critical piece, yeah. For sure, for sure. So so yeah, I think it's um, knowing how to use the, the the tool to your benefit. It's definitely a, a goal of the human, but. But I think it's um, yeah, just gotta make sure it's it's really serving you correctly. Um, mm. And I think that's where, where the ingenuity of the human c comes into play. Um, but uh, but I think the only way to really use it correctly is to use it a lot and be a friend of it. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, and I think that's that's the main challenge. Maybe for some folks out there that may be a little reluctant to try it because they're like, oh, it's gonna replace me, so I'm not going to use it. Uh, you know, I think it's more about just trying it out and see what it really can do and, and cannot do. Um, but, but yeah, it's kind of my take on that. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a, a person who's uh, Jenna Carraro has just given us a, a comment on LinkedIn there. And she's saying, she's as someone who is neurodiverse. Um, it, I'm assuming she's talking about AI, really helps her to speed up her connections and cognitive processes for writing CVs, cover letters, et cetera. But those skills and beliefs are something that are a part of her. And then she does revise them, right? So it comes down to ethics. So like, let's let's talk about that, you know, ethics right there. Like, for example, um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I know it's kind of out of the blue, but does your company, Elsa, do you have a policy on on the use of AI as an AI company? Like, do you like, is there a written policy that everybody can look at and say, here's when we use it, when we don't, you know, here's how we use it in communications. Here's what data we can put in. Do you have that like a written statement? Yeah. So, you know, every, every client has sort of a, a different requirement. So, you know, when it comes to, and, and that's, that's what we try to do, right. We don't dictate what our customers uh, uh, should or shouldn't do. We help them achieve what they want to do. So for example, in Europe, as you know, you know, data privacy laws are, are really strong. And so we adapt to that, right. Um, in other cases, you know, when we're talking about um, giving access uh, to kids uh, to our AI, uh, there's some limitations in terms of how much content they can access. For example, making sure that if they are running a AI tutor conversation, that that conversation doesn't lead to maybe the use of curse words and, and things like that. So we, we try to limit that. Um, but honestly, you know, we're still learning what that means. And, and I think mm -hmm. the industry in general also. Um, but uh, I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, every, our clients choose what they want to do. And, and, and hopefully we're, we're not doing something wrong when, when 
you know, our clients ask us uh, to do what they want. Um, so uh, I haven't, I haven't faced any, any kind of ethical dilemma yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of excited for that time to come to, to see what that means and what that mm -hmm. is. Um, uh, but so far it hasn't really been like a, a sure. Issue. Yeah. A hundred percent. I'm, Ed, do you have, um, do each of your clients or the people that you work with, do you find that for instance, their data use policy, is that different? You know, is, does it, does it differ radically across each of the clients in terms of what you can put into an A model, AI model and whatnot? Cause as we all know, just want to say it out here, you know, when you put something into chat GPT or BART or whatever, it becomes a part of the system. It becomes tech, sure. you know, and, and in some cases, somebody could write a question sometime in chat GPT and be like, oh, wow, that's interesting. And they're getting your, you know, your private data um, sure. kind of thing. There's the famous Samsung issue where the, the developers put all the Sam Samsung's proprietary code in there, right? To have it, check it out. And now it's part of the public database. So do you, do you, are, do you, have you found um, those data use policies to differ radically? Yeah, we, we basically have uh, sort of two, two uh, models there. So some clients don't want uh, us to retain that data. So we don't, we don't retain it. Some other clients uh, don't mind. And what do we do with that data? Well, first of all, it's, we sort of, uh, you know, uh, it's an anonymous, right? So we're not necessarily tracking uh, per person, which is what we care about is actually just getting all these different audio recordings and using it to improve our algorithm so that the next student that uses our pronunciation app gets a, a more accurate response. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's really important for us, right? That's what, that's really our secret sauce is, you know, we are the most accurate because we have 53 million users, you know, every day using our app, improving our algorithm so that then their experience can be better. So. The data is necessary. I mean, we, we need mm -hmm. that data so we can serve the customer. But again, some customers don't want us to retain that data, and, and that's fine. How much did 53 million users a day tap into this thing and receive feedback about their pronunciation of the English language? This is something that, that you know, I don't know how to ask this question. At what point does your model become perfect? You know what I mean? Like, is it, does it really like continue to evolve and amalgamate every single day in some way? But I mean, I'm just thinking with, with 53 million users a day, it's, there's gotta be a point where you're like, you know what, this is pretty darn solid. Like, you know, there's only so many ways to say English, you know, to say the English. <laughs> All right. Um, believe it or not, it's, it's a, it's a super hard problem to, to solve. Oh. Um, <laughs> yes, a million, I, 100 on that one. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's super complicated. Um, and while we are the forefront of it, um, you know, I think there's still so much room to to improve. I mean, today we have about 90 percent accuracy. So, for every 10 words that you you know speak uh, on our app and, and get feedback on. Probably one of those words will be misinterpreted. You know, uh, it won't understand what you, you said, right? Mm. Um, and that's that's not that bad, but but it can be, right? So even this morning, I had this call with a, 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 a corporate client uh, wanting to bring our technology to their workers in India to help them improve uh, their pronunciation, right? And they noticed that yes, one out of ten words. We're being, you know, uh, we're we're not correctly uh, given feedback to, to, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's still a challenge, right? It's not perfect. So, so then I, I go back to the role of the teacher, where is well, they need to interpret, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Also, the response. So, if because again, our technology is not going to be perfect. Maybe nine out of ten, but once, you know, I, 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 you know, one, one out of ten times, it won't be correct, and so the teacher will have to have. Uh, kind of a say there, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's still a lot of room to to grow, um, and yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's what Elsa has been working on for almost ten years, um, and I think sure. it's gonna keep working on. So what are so what are the you know you just mentioned kind of one one not objection but maybe maybe like you know a a flag or a pushback from a client. What other types of objections or questions concerns you know like you know, when you're out there trying to close a deal, 
and you're saying, look, this is going to really improve your your workflow, and this is going to you know you know level up your workforce. Really, you know, the, like the educational component of leveling up your workforce is profound. What are the what are the things that you get pushed back on? Other than sure. cost, obviously. Cost. <laughs> of course, cost is always important. Um, so, I think there's there's maybe camps. I mean, there are those who have you know they're true believers, right, in the AI and and, but that could be a bad thing, right? Because maybe their, their expectation is that, you know, we, with the use of our tool, um, their workers can improve their English level in, you know, two days, right? Mm. I mean, we can't do that, right? That's, that's not, you know, you know, that's uh, beyond the expectation that, that we can meet. And so there's an education around, okay, what it is that you can expect, right? So, we say, for example, with 10 minutes a day with our solution, um, within a span of three months, you can improve one or two English levels, right? Mm. And that's, you know, that's realistic. But yeah. if they believe that they could maybe in, you know, 10 days with a couple of minutes a day, that they would improve their English significantly, then that's not the case. So so sometimes it's just about like lowering expectations. Um, mm. On the other hand, then there's like the 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 ones that start off with maybe negativity, let's say. And my, my approach there is always to try not to react to that. You know, maybe it's more of a sales tip out there uh, for for sales folks out there. It's you know n n not try to speak against what they're saying, right? But rather try to understand where they're coming from. Um, so, uh, for instance, this example that I, that I mentioned where there was a lot of uh, focus on the one word out of 10 that we get wrong instead of focusing on the nine out of 10 that we get right. Mm -hmm. So trying to explain, you know, that we're not perfect and that you shouldn't expect us to be perfect, but that the alternative is way worse, right? Which means you cannot scale with, all the humans, uh, mm -hmm. the improvement of communication skills, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think that's those are some of the ideas out there. But, but, but yeah, there's. Well, yeah, and you just named like one of the misconceptions, you know, sort of, hey, you know, you've got this, you've got this tool, and so I, I'm going to be able to radically get, you know, better, faster, you know, so much, you know, so rapidly. I, I love how that also then just again raises that that flag of. Okay, look, we Duolingo as one of the, you know the world's most famous examples. It's like, hey, you know, you can you can start learning a language there, but guess what? If you don't show up every day, if you don't do your, you know, your hour every day, you're not you know you're not going to take those steps forward. It's like any other skill. At the end of the day, we are still human, right? Sure. Um, and so putting in the work is that's it's it's a non negotiable, right? It has to be done. So yeah, it's a. Uh we haven't gotten to the point where, you know, like in the matrix, you just put in a chip and, and then you know it Not maybe. Right. I mean, I feel like everything's possible. So, but we're not there yet. You still got to, you know, uh, sweat a little bit and, and yeah, put in the work. Um, we I, can't solve I just that don't yet. know. What, what would that be like? You know, you got Elon Musk's or Elon Musk's, uh, you know, mind, whatever the, the, oh, that, right. that company where they're plugging into your brain. Like, what would that be like if you could just like push a button and then suddenly, Oh, Hey, I, I now have Chinese as a fluency. That's great. Yeah, I just I have no idea what what that flipping that switch might switch might look like. It's crazy. Talk to me, like sort of, kind of, kind of bringing us back full circle. Like, so where where do you see things going over the next, let's just say, near term, 18, 16 months, you know, twenty four months around that interface between the L and D department and the HR department using a tool like Elsa, um, it, you know. Do you see that? I think there's a lot of fear around. Do you see those those staff shrinking and you know more being accomplished by by um, by fewer people? Do you feel like is more of an evolution in that job in those jobs? Um, and so you know they're going to just be evolving how they're inputting into the process, or like what are you what are you look seeing there? Uh, I mean, that, I, you know, it's a, it's a hard question, right? To uh, and predict in the future, you know, it's, it's impossible. <laughs> um, I think. You know, I kind of think about the, the present day, right? We, we all know we we are in a, sort of a economic uh, 
uh, scenario where profit is really important, you know, uh, cost reduction, um, meaning we got to make sure that whichever investment, you know, whichever activity or, or initiative we're putting money into it, that it's really giving us value uh, back, right? Return on, on our investment. So, and that I think applies to everything in every department. When it comes to learning and development, um, I think, first of all, being able to measure ROI has always been super hard, right? And and really, that's a shame because that's, I think, one of the reasons why L&D budgets ha- have always been somewhat limited because mm-hmm. they haven't been able to, to really prove. Now that pressure is even stronger now to be able to do that. So from my perspective, which is a very small part of the, of the, the world, which is, you know, how do we make sure that investment on, on making sure learners, making sure workers are improving their speaking skills? Well, what we do is we're constantly measuring everything. So if you're a worker running a, you're talking to you or speaking to your, your AI tutor, well, we assess that and every other activity that you have. So we know exactly what your English level is today. And we know at every single activity that you run, what, what, it, what, how it improves. So we're able to very easily show that if you start at, let's say, a 80% or like a B1 level, and then in two months you went to a 90%, it's very clear that your score has improved and we can show that, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that just applies to anything around education that uh, now there's more pressure to, to show that result. Um, that's what I would say is like the, the main focus and, and the focus that I uh, try to bring to the conversation when I when I talk to L and D uh, folks out there. But. Okay, final final question for you. And this, I love these conversations. But you know, final question for you is: How much do you see the line blurring between a person, you know, an individual's experience in a learning setting like this, between interfacing with a human and interfacing with an AI model? And so this goes to the ability to AI to personalize a situation, the ability, you know, or the need for, I'm because I'm like, I have this vision of, you know, like one, let's just say one English coach with, you know, 500 students and they're able to just kind of like, you know, they, you, you, I, I have this vision of, you know, they're kind of in that room with, you know, with 500 screens and, you know, as the AI model saying, Hey, they need, you know, you can kind of blip in there, blip in there, you know, like what's, how much is that line blurring between working with a human and working with an AI? Um, I think, I think we're sort of, uh, in the midst of that, right? So, so I think we're still figuring out the role of each and Mm -hmm. when they should work together or or separately. Um, well, I mean, what I can say is that the focus that at least that we're having is we're trying to solve for the needs of two different interests. On one hand, we want to help the individual, right? We want to help with their deficiencies when it comes to speaking skills, but we also want to be able to help uh, accomplish the goals of the organization, what they Mm -hmm. care about. Mm -hmm. So in a simple example, if we have a project manager from India running international projects in English, well, What does he care or she care about? Well, we would need to be able to recommend certain contents just for him or for her and based on his or her deficiencies. Um, And that's something our art technology can do. It can just detect what your issues are and then recommend certain content just for you. And it's also auto-generated. So the content gets generated just for you, for your needs. But on the other hand, the company cares about the project manager being able to speak very clearly when it comes to the job role. So mm-hmm. maybe having a meeting uh, where the, you know, uh, the project manager presents the status report of that meeting. Well, that's very specific and it's, it's, it's job, you know, uh, it's job relevant, right? So we would be needing to provide content that's related to that job. 
So we, when you meet those both of those needs, you know, you're improving the individual needs of every single person, but at the same time, you're adding content and skill related to the job that they have to do every day. Then that becomes very tactical, right? Because from our perspective, we're not teaching general English, right? You know, we don't necessarily care about teaching, you know, Shakespeare, right? What we need to do is make sure that if you need a specific lingo, um, if you have a very specific job, that you can do that job very well in English, right? And that's how we can actually improve in a short time, right? When you have uh, a very specific use of the, the, the of English, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of our approach to really make sure that workers are improving their English skills uh, where they need to, right? And not just sort of a generalistic approach, which yields to kind of poor results. Um, nice. Yeah. So I, I love that. So it's like you're inserting at the moment or where, you know, both with specific language, with specific need in specific moments, you know, it's that learning the flow of work kind of thing and whatnot. Excellent. Indeed. Indeed. It's indeed. Sure. Pablo, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy day to talk with us about Elsa, about, and uh, you know, when AI is appropriate, when we still need humans and, you know, just taking on the challenge of, of these, this, you know, this complex conversation. If somebody wants to talk to you more, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, they can reach out uh, via LinkedIn. Um, you can, you can find me there. Uh, just Paulo Ferreiro. Um, and I'm sure you'll, you'll find me as, uh, you know, leading Elsa for, for the Americas. Um, and uh, I could, share my email later also uh, on the comments on the on the LinkedIn post but but yeah thank you so much Ladek for for the opportunity it was a fun chat uh, I hope uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it as well so so yeah thank you so much thank you again for listening to the eLearn podcast here from open LMS I just wanted to ask one more time if you enjoyed this show if you learned something if you were inspired if you you were challenged if you feel like you know this is something you can take into your practice please do me a favor and right now on your podcast player hit subscribe that way you're never going to miss a future episode also come over to elearnmagazine.com and subscribe there as well because we have tons of great information about how to create killer online learning outcomes thanks <laughs>